conversation with Coach Wooden about religion, and they did not agree. But I watched Coach Wooden love him, and I watched him value his heart, and I watched him it unequivocally not compromise his own beliefs, but also that he was not going to hold Bill Walton to the standards that he didn't adopt for himself. He wasn't going to hold people to standards they didn't have, but that didn't lessen the standards that he had in his life for his walk and for his relationship with Jesus. So that's really been my mentor for how to live my faith. You know, it's just as important to me, I, I think about our players. They've declared, and I don't know how they exactly know this, but that women's basketball is the most diverse sport in college athletics, all of college athletics, more than football, more than basketball. The dynamic of socioeconomics, race, religion, sexuality, you name it, all it's been declared the most diverse sport in college athletics. And even though my faith is the most important thing in my life, is the thing that is my calling, it's why I coach. I'm, you know, I thought I was, I told God, okay, I want to be married by 28, I want to have kids by, you know, and now I'm 35, and I'm single, and God had some different ideas, but I do believe that coaching is my calling, it's not my job, it's my calling. But, it is just as important that Paulina Hersler from Sweden, who comes from a very atheist culture, um, feels just and loved and valued by me, as Kerry Corver, whose dad started a church in Compton and prays for me every day. But, you know, I, I think about that podcast, and one of the habits that God has really put upon my heart is before every game, I give the pregame talk or whatever, and I'm actually not very motivational, so the team is glad to get out of the court. And so, <laughs> but the team all goes out to the court to warm up, and the staff goes out, and it's a very treasured time for me. I sit in every locker and just pray for every kid. And it's one of my favorite things because I think it's just me and God doing the work behind the scenes. And that God values behind the scenes. And then I walk and sometimes in front of thousands of people, I would like for it to be more thousands of people in Poly Pavilion, quite frankly. But I try to remind myself in that time as I just sit in the locker and pray for every single person on our team and staff that that's more important work than anything that's going to be happening in the next two hours in the performance out on the court. And that that's what God values. Is a very centering time for me. But that's what Coach Wooden actually modeled for me. I was just going to ask, uh, how, how long have you had that practice? Um, I've been doing that. I've been doing that since I became the head coach at UCLA. So for five, five years going on six. That I, 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 and I've always, I've never been the coach to stay in the locker room. So I'm like, what do I do with this time? You know? <laughs> um, but. Uh, I've been doing that for five years, and, and I, like anything else, like I said earlier, it probably has done more for my heart than anything else, um, but it's been a, one of my most treasured times. I, you know, my fourth day on the job, um, John Valley, who was one of Coach Wooden's players, walks into my office, and I, I've been around Coach, like I said, for 15 years, I've met a lot of his players, I'd never met John Valley. I didn't actually know who he was. I just knew he was the dribble for the cure guy. And I was overwhelmed. I hadn't even hired a staff yet. And they said, you got to meet with this guy. We do dribble for the cure. And I'm like, okay. And he comes in and he sits across from my table and he looks me in the eye. And without even practically introducing himself, himself he says, I've been married for 38 years because of what Coach Wooden taught me. I started three successful businesses because of what Coach Wooden taught me. <coughs> I've conquered cancer three times because of the tools that Coach Wooden gave me. Then he really got me. I survived the death of my 12-year-old daughter because of the way Coach Wooden loved me. And I, at that time, I had tears in my eyes and my mouth was And I was silent. He said, I am the man I am because of UCLA basketball and what the leadership that Coach Wooden gave me. And I didn't, remember, I didn't know who he was. So we deal with our business after that, and he leaves, and I'm like, Google, okay. And he didn't even mention that he was a starting guard on two of Coach Wooden's national championship teams and that he played seven years in the NBA because it paled in comparison to the man he became. And I thought, that's it. That's it. Nothing short of that is okay in my mission. That in 10, 12, 20 years, I want my players to say that. Oh, and by the way, I played in the WNBA championship and made money overseas and won a national championship. And we put the banner, the first women's basketball banner in Pauley Pavilion. 
Oh, but that pales in comparison to the young woman I became. And John Valley, at that time, planted the seeds for my big, bold vision that I knew I could not do in the flesh, I could not do in my own strength, that I needed Jesus desperately, but if God showed up, anything was possible. And so, that's what my quest has been. That's what I am humbly trying to do every single day, messing up more days than I'm successful, but just trying to go back to, it's not mine, it's his. It's interesting, <clears throat> like I said before, God always gets me to don't share the perfect story, Corey. Don't share the per perfect speech. I enjoy speaking, um, but it can be, um, if an overused strength can become a weakness if it's not done in the right spirit. So every time, that's why I think I got emotional at the beginning, and I'm sure I'll get emotional again. Because every time when I have a chance to truly share about what God's done in my life, He says, not about you, it's about me. So this year has been hard. Uh, remember what remember what I said about God having to do what only God can do. Well, let me tell you this: be careful what you pray for. Last off season, I moved, and then my parents ended up moving, and they had to move out of their house in Santa Barbara, but they really had nowhere to go. So we decided, okay, we'll put your stuff in storage, and my mom is borderline pack rat, and I got the bill, because I was going to have to pay for this, and $13,000 to move my parents' stuff and put it in storage. So I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pay for that, but um, we're going to figure this thing out. And so my parents are going to house sit for me in the summer when I'm gone, because I travel a lot in the summer, and then they're going to um, go visit people with my frequent flyer mileage when I come back home. So we started that process. Then we went to Australia in August, and that, of course, doesn't sound like a burden, but for the student athlete, it's amazing. For the staff, it is really, really hard because there are very little off times, and in May, I canceled my vacation to move and move my parents. And in August, when you have the normal time where you also have time off, that um, we went to Australia, so we had training camp, and then we went, took our team to Australia, which was amazing, but it was not easy. I was tired, and I scheduled 20 home visits in the month of September. Between, ninth, between the 9th and the 29th of September, I had 20 home visits. And I have this tradition with our team, which is really fun. I don't know if any of you have read the book, One Word, but it challenges you to think of one word that you want to change in your character over the course of a year. And to really think about what God might want to do in your heart and your character. And to declare that one word and just really almost pray through it for a year. Now, we don't talk about the whole pray through it part with our team. And, but we all, every year in August, come up with one word. And every year it's really fun because at the banquet, one of our players recounts how they have seen the one word manifest itself in their teammates' lives. And they get to every year in their locker Maybe one year it's trust, and one year it's discipline, or one year it's whatever, and they list them, and over four years, and at the end, when they graduate, they take those with them. And it's really a neat thing. Well, this August, I was just struggling with my one word. I could not figure it out. Last year, my one word was discipline, and my one word the year before was trust, but every player and staff member gets to choose their own. And I just couldn't figure it out. I was just struggling. And then all of a sudden, um, I, it came to me a little bit later. I kept putting off doing the activity with our team because I didn't have mine. We're actually going to declare them this coming weekend. But God knew. I'll, I'll give you this, uh, what my one word is in just a second. So those things happen. I'm pretty tired. This year, we were just last week picked uh, to win the Pac-12. First time since 1999. Well, it's very fun. I'm excited about that. But there are now expectations. And our team has never been the hunted. We've been the underdog the whole time since I've been here. I have to raise between six hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars this year. I'm already tired. On September 9th, I was leaving to go on the road, and my dad said to me, Corey, I don't, something's not right. Can you call your trainer and ask me for them for their your cardiologist that you work with at UCLA? My dad is the biggest procrastinator ever. He doesn't get on anything. And I got him the name that day, and the next day he was in the office. He knew that something was wrong. 
and he um, he went in. He turns out he has three blocked, three and a half blocked arteries, and once he went into the hospital on the 29th, the day I got back, he's still there. I got. I'll tell you more about my dad in a second, but I have to find a new place to live for them on the west side because he has to stay here for the next six months for his therapy. It's now going to cost two thousand dollars a month for my father's meds. I'm so far behind on every front of my life. He, um, he God's not done with him yet. He was. Uh, the doctors have told us twice in the last month that he won't make it through the next twenty-four hours. And both times he has. I, don't, I have no idea how much time I have with my dad left. And there, I sometimes feel so overwhelmed. But uh, he's enough. And I pray that the God of I do not live my life without God showing up. And I know I can't do this year without God showing up. And I read about manna. And that is my, my word. For the year. Sorry, guys. It's okay. <laughs> I have no uh, choice. But it's cool because I can honestly tell you that, I look over at that clock, I'm going to get in trouble. But um, I can honestly tell you, I'm driving over here today and I'm thinking, uh, I truly have the joy of the Lord, is truly my strength. I can truly tell you that I'm learning that His mercies are new every morning, that His promises are true. I can truly tell you, not just say the right things like I was a little kid when I shared with you earlier, but I can truly tell you that like in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own human understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. In the next verse, in the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. And I'm experiencing that. On the outside, my life is chaos right now. And I don't know how I'm going to do it in my own strength. I feel so behind in every area. But God is truly my strength and His peace is truly surpassing my human understanding. Like I told you, the upcoming season um, is really exciting. I... They, I was asked to share about that, but really the only thing for me is the only way I, think about I can lead our team well is if I focus on the man. There's a saying that we have in practice all the time that performance equals potential minus interferences. Performance equals potential minus interferences. So we might be preseason ranked ninth in the country and be picked to win the Pac-12 this year, but if I get distracted... If I don't stay present with the manna for the today, if I worry about the expectations of the future, if I'm too overwhelmed by providing for my parents, if I don't stay present, I could have the potential of a nine, but if I got the interferences of a seven, I'm going to perform at a two. And that is my challenge, to live with the manna that God provides for today. I can't take it into tomorrow's practice. All I've got is today, what God's given me today. And so I'm imperfectly... And, but fervently, going to ask God to teach my heart all year about His manner. It's interesting, um, I think about <clears throat> why I would love for you guys to come to our games this year. And I'm going to um, give free tickets to anyone who want them. They're all worth you can take as many as you want, and if you want more, talk to Jan, and she'll figure out how to get them to you. Um, but, uh, you know, I would love for you to come, and I'd love for you to see our outward um, performance. But my real dream is that maybe some of you would become our new friends because you would know what's happening before we step out on the court. You would know what God's doing, not only in our team's hearts, but in my heart. And that we are imperfectly trying to do something that can only be done if God shows up. And so my, my real desire in leadership and teaching is to love them and love them and love them and love them until they ask why. And to give them tools so that they say what John Valley said. That they are achieving their dreams. And they are doing amazing things. And they are the women that they are because they chose to come to UCLA basketball. So... 
I share all that to tell you from my heart that we're really excited about the season, and I do think this could be the best year in UCLA history if we stay healthy and we continue to improve and we stay focused on the manna for today. I may use different language. That's the coolest thing about being in teaching and loving Jesus is that God doesn't need me to say all the perfect words. And remember what um, Francis Assisi said, preach the gospel always and if necessary use words that I can talk exactly about being present for the day and staying focused on the process. And um, really I know that I'm speaking of manna, but I, in front of being church and state and being respectful of people's backgrounds that there's so many great biblical principles um, that cross all those lines, right? And so I'm imperfectly trying to love our players exactly right where they are and to give them the tools to teach, mentor, and equip them uh, for life beyond UCLA so that they talk like John Bowie did. So that's really where I am. That's for the most part what I have to share with you. But my hope would be that I get to develop our relationships with you um, in the future and that I get a chance to lean on you more as I know that um, you guys are Jan Cloyds and uh, Don and Sherry Morrison's friends of mine, um, that uh, they are, <clears throat> you're their friends. So I'm hoping that you'll become my friends too. Um, that's pretty much what I have to share with you today is um, just to be sort of where we are, what God's doing in my own heart, my, my desire and vision for our program. And uh, can I just open it up for any questions? When you had mentioned um, that you love and love and love until they ask why. Yeah. So when they ask why, is that when you... Yeah, when they ask why, then they, why? yeah, then they get a chance. I actually, um, there's been so many amazing things. I have talked le less about my faith um, in my job here at UCLA, and two kids have asked to be baptized in my pool. Um, they've been, I mean, it's been all these amazing opportunities. Four players have come to know God since I've been here, and I've probably talked about God the least. Um, but yes, to answer your question, when they ask why, that's when I have an opportunity to say, well, I'm not saying this has to be yours, but you ask me why, and this is what governs the way I love you. And then I talk about my faith. And really, it's how Jesus saved me. Yeah? Do you spend any time with your team and either a silent moment or meditation? Do you have that practice? Yeah, you know, they... Um, they actually pray before every game, um, but that is completely driven by them. And in fact, I usually go to some of the players that I, do, I know that are not of faith and say, if you just say one word that you're uncomfortable, we won't do it. It's really driven and led by them. Um, we also do yoga, which is a big piece of really learning how to breathe, and um, we do that on a, excuse me, on a consistent basis. And so um, <clears throat> really want to give them tools um, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, um, for them to uh, decide on their own quest. But yes, it is a, a big part. Also, we have a mental trainer that really um, does, um, he does these sound files that helps them visualize and breathe. And um, he does them all individually for every player. So he, Right, and he puts them on their phone and they're able to just press play and he encourages them to do it before they go to bed at night and he makes them personal to all of them. So he's actually a psychology professor at UCLA. Yeah. Follow up question. How many hours a week do these women work out? Uh, well, technically probably just work out um, about 20. But that's really a deceiving number right now because and it's actually a very hot topic in the NCAA right now with uh, student yeah, welfare. Right? Exactly. Well, they, because they have to go to the training room. So I'll give you an example. If you are injured, um, you probably have to be at the training room at 7 in the morning. We have practice at 8.30. 7 in the morning, you're in the training room. Uh, 8.30, we start practice. Um, at 11, we're probably done. And then you have weights three days a week. And then you probably have to get in the cold tub after that. Then we have training table. And then you go on to have class, tutors, mentors, etc. the rest of the day. So it is a major time commitment. So we're on paper, they call them countable hours, they're, but that's a very controversial term right now. They're trying to redefine, but um, countable hours that we're allowed 20 hours a week at this time of year. Um, but you don't count that hour in the training room, you don't count that hour in the cold tub, you don't count the, you know, there are certain things that you don't have to count. And so um, there's a lot of time. 
you know, this is the first I've heard of women that was faith-based. And uh, do any other coaches follow that model like you are? I mean, it's, yes. It worked pretty well. No, it did work pretty well, didn't it? Um, <laughs> now, he was an amazingly disciplined and uh, principle-centered man, and that's what I admired about him the most, is that his ability to um, line up his um, actions with his words and his faith, and, you know, that's all of our quest, you know, to um, have that be more and more in line as we draw closer to Jesus. But, yes, there are lots of them. Um, for instance, Virginia's men, um, uh, Coach Bennett back there, he does an amazing job. Um, he's really trying to walk in that way. I really learned a lot from my old boss at Florida State, um, Sue Semrau. She's really uh, taught me what that really looks like. And so there are others that are trying to do that. And, you know, it's a really interesting thing in a public institution to try to do that really, really well um, and have it be the governing principle of your life, um, but also create an environment where you have student athletes that can say, you know, we are really different and isn't that cool? You know, I have so much to learn from you. So it's a very, you know, broad and delicate line to walk. Um, but yeah, there actually are several others that are seeking to do that. Any other questions? Hello, by the way. A comment and a bit of a question. I would just have to say I've, I've been with Jan to a number of the, the women's basketball games, and I have to say that they are fun, they're exciting, these women are scrappy, they are civil to one another, you can tell they really care for one another. And contrary to the, the men's team, they actually win. It's a <laughs> 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 The men are going to win this year, too. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's our hope, I mean, that's our hope and our prayer. But it's, uh, it's really a privilege to be able to see the, um, the fruit of, mm -hmm. of your investment. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, would you, if this may be an inappropriate, inappropriate question, so answer if you're yeah. comfortable with it. But my sense is that there is this extraordinary transformation that happens from day one of a, a young woman's walking into your program and the day, the day that they mm -hmm. go to the banquet and it's over. It would, could you share a story without, you bet. without a name of you bet. what you have seen? Yeah, you know, that's really our, um, it's, it's our, above my desk is uncommon women making uncommon choices, yielding an uncommon result. And that uncommon result is for us to create a transformational experience for these young women through sports. And um, I'll give you two really quick ones. One is, and I, she doesn't mind me sharing her name because um, she, she shared it herself publicly on several occasions. But Naira Fields graduated last year. She's the youngest of seven children. She has six older brothers. She left Canada when she was in the seventh grade, went to uh, four high schools in four years in the United States with this dream to go play Division I basketball. Ended up her senior year moving in with Mike Brown, who at the time was the coach of the Lakers, uh, for a short period. And he, uh, she went to modern-day high school, and we ended up recruiting her in UCLA. Um, she was so guarded. I remember one time, the first year, we were going to Oklahoma, and she just calls me up and said, I'm not going, coach. I, I'm, I've been coaching, at that time, tw uh, 19 years at the time, and I was like, never in 19 years have I ever had a student athlete do this. So I was like, a little dumbfounded. I said, what's going on? I can't tell you. And I said, well, how am I supposed to be okay with this? And I, I really, I got waffled to kicking her off the team to, I better, until I know the full picture, I better just, um, you know, tread lightly. Thankfully, I treaded lightly, and I still, I still to this day do not know exactly what was happening. She goes, this is the only way I know how to deal with this. And she goes, I need you to let me deal with this in my way. And I am a real relational person. There's no real question that it bothers me, and so I sometimes ask too many. And she one day stopped me and said, Coach, I have been in a different city every year for six years. I have had an abuse, come up in an abusive situation, a very unstable home. I don't trust easily. If you will give, let me have time and give me time, I eventually will let you in. And she was proved true to her word. And at the banquet last year, she went on to be one of the prolific scorers in our program, uh, got drafted by the Phoenix Mercury, made the WNBA, and was one of the youngest players that played in a significant role in the Olympics this summer for Team Canada. It's so neat. But a very sweet <clears throat> shot. Uh, yes, she does have a very good shot. But she, at the banquet, said, Coach, most of the time you got on my last nerve. <laughs> most of the time I did not like you. Most of the time you made me really uncomfortable. But there was never one time in four years I didn't know that I was unconditionally loved. 
And for me, that was everything. She let me in. She let me in. So I'm really, really proud and humbled by the chance to have those experiences. Um, I got a text message from um, someone playing overseas the other day, and uh, it was Luiana, and she said, Luvulu, and she's from Portugal. <clears throat> It doesn't just happen with the foreign kids, um, but she just texted me the other day and said, you know, um, I'm leading my family through some difficult things, and I never would have been equipped if I didn't go to UCLA. And so to me, it's worth it all. So, you know, that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to create an uncommon transformational experience. And, and the more you get to know these young women, the more stories you'll hear. I could be here all day telling you stories, but those are two that have happened just recently. <laughs> I appreciate you. I snowed you. Um, I, um, you know, there's a lot of actually coaches that are doing some really amazing work at UCLA. Miss um, Val with gymnastics, she had a very similar heart to that. Uh, Amanda Cromwell with women's soccer. These are just the ones I know intimately that are really trying to serve their athletes and really transform lives through sport. Um, you know, I actually, I am um, one of the assistant men's coaches, uh, Ed Schilling, his wife played for me. And, um, and I've worked with a lot of men's staffs, and they, they're not always easy, and it's not always a great relationship between men's and women's basketball. I will tell you, um, in the midst of tons of controversy and pressure and whatever you say about Steve Alford, um, this, is the, uh, this is the staff who values women more than any other staff I've worked with. So they are the easiest staff I've been in 23 years that, um, to work with. So I'm very thankful for that. And I think they really love their guys. So, <clears throat> and I hope they win a lot of games this year. But, um, but there, are, there are a lot more than get publicized. Their stories don't get out there. But there's a lot of coaches that are sacrificially investing in the lives, not just the athletes, the lives of UCLA. So, any other questions? Or probably, I'm already five minutes over, so. Well, thank you everybody for your time. I really appreciate it.